I think the most important thing is, which is very new in a sense, is collaboration. You know, I came from a, a, a tradition, so did my kids even, where you did exams and you put your hand over to make sure the person next to you couldn't see what you were writing. We don't live in that world anymore. We live in a world of, of absolute collaboration. No one will achieve anything unless they know how to work as team, teams and to collaborate. That wasn't anything to do with what we were taught at school. And the other thing is, uh, the other acid test, I'm using my mobile for this, until we realise that when a teacher, for example, is putting uh, lesson plans or homework on a, on a um, blackboard and one kid from the back walks to the front and photographs the blackboard to take it home, it's a moment in the UK they would, they would confiscate his phone. Until we realise that that is the smartest kid and that the ones standing sitting there doing this are not that smart. Until we cross that bridge, we're going to struggle. The assessment process has got to be brought in line with the way in which we are able to teach. Until we can do that, we're going to have a, dis a kind of discontinuity. And, and the question you ask then becomes valid, that we're, we're teaching to the test, as it were. We've got to be much, much cleverer about the process of testing and what, it, what testing really is. How do we really discover what people's skills are? Listen, I left school, I was thrown out of school with three O-levels. I'm not a stupid person. So I have to believe that it was the process by which I was being assessed at school that was wrong, not me. The great game, if you like, for learning is to capture children's imagination and capture a love of learning by using whatever means that they fall in love with. Now, of course there will be uh, young, young people who will fall in love with the process of writing. That's brilliant. There will be other process, uh, young people who will fall in love with other processes, but you just heard it from three different speakers. What we have to do is capture the imagination of the learner in the way that the learner wishes to learn, the way that learner wants to respond. Most of my friends who have been extraordinarily successful were very, very poor students. Each one of them were lucky, like me, in finding something very early in their, uh, their, their, their non-school career that they loved and they used that as a process. I'm a learning junkie. I, I cannot learn enough. I can't read enough. I can't get enough learning. But no one at school told me that. I personally believe the period from kindergarten through to 14 should be making young people very, very able in terms of, of course, the, the basics. They should be able to read, they should be able to write, they should be able to have fundamental mathematical skills, but they should also learn to how to use the audio-visual media and their imaginations, and also how to interrogate and use information. At 14, you begin to identify what their individual passions and skills are likely to be, and then you teach them through using that you teach them in career paths through to what they would really love to be. And that can take five years, can take 10 years, could take longer. Uh, so I actually think the great, for me, the great dividing moment is around 14, when young people have got to kind of step up and say, well, okay, I understand all the basics. I understand what life's about. I understand how to gather information. Now how am I gonna use all those things that I now understand? Find your passion. Find your passion and then use your passion as a means to learn and understand the, the, the ramifications of that passion. Understand the consequences of, of, of learning and understanding the consequences of being dumb. Consequences of being dumb are really very serious because you're not going to have a very fulfilled life. have a real problem with this notion that, that there's this thing called entertainment, there's a thing called learning. I mean, to me, when I read, a, a, when I, I look at something absolutely extraordinary, a documentary, and I'm really learning about how rivers uh, 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 flood, for example, am I being entertained or am I learning? That's the whole process. You know, when I used to make movies, I've made movies 30 years of my life. A lot of people say, well, are you making an entertainment movie or are you making a message film? They say, I never even looked at it like that. I mean, uh, is The Killing Fields an entertaining film or is it a message? Is The Chariot Safari a message or an entertaining film? Look, every, my job was to thoroughly entertain and engross people and have them walk across the foyer after the movie having learned something, something of value, something to discuss over dinner, something to maybe argue about. That's the process. I think that uh, the, one of the biggest single problems is that the press generally, the Daily Mail worse than the Murdoch press even, are extraordinarily reactionary. And they tend to play to the fears of older people. The, the, there is a fear of technology that they fan. Um, I don't think they've remotely understood where young people are, what the opportunities are, or how remarkable many, 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 I would actually say most young people are. Uh, and therefore the, the, there's a certain ageism in the press media which is about defending their own patch uh, they're, they're actually trying to 
protect newspapers and an awful lot of their attitudes and an awful lot of their propaganda is actually designed to protect the news, the newsprint medium. Uh, they're terrified, I think, of, honestly, of the online world, of the audiovisual world. It's a world they're not familiar with, they don't know how to monetize it, um, and uh, they would like it to go away. So, no, I think that, I actually think that the newspapers are irrelevant. Sadly, the only people that don't yet think they're irrelevant are politicians. Politicians are still like drivers driving through a rear view mirror. They're constantly looking backwards to see what the, how the media approve of what they're doing, how these are press media approve of what they're doing, instead of looking forwards to see actually what the opportunities of the 21st century really are. I think that the level of engagement young people will want 20 years from now is of a different order entirely to what it is today. They want answers. Uh, they're going to want a lot more truth. They will not be manipulated in the same way that they are at, the pre at present, I don't believe. Uh, they will be vulnerable to manipulation because I think the sheer scale of some of the crises could be overwhelming. Uh, but I think that um, any politician, any 21st century politician that doesn't understand that the electorate, young people, will want a different kind of behaviour from them, different kind of engagement from them, different level of truth and trust from them, is, uh, shouldn't be in politics. Better get out fast because they're going to look very stupid very quickly. Yes, I think the, US, the last US election was a glimpse into what's to come. And one of the problems that uh, President Obama has at the moment is there was a raising of, in a sense, unrealisable expectations. Um, because he was so charismatic, because his use of the new media was so sophisticated and successful, uh, it raised the bar of expectations. The problem is he's still dealing in, he's still dealing in old politics. So it's very interesting. He was elected using new politics, but he's having to deal with and govern the nation using old politics. And that's where that discontinuity exists. Until, until it's a seamless ride, if you like, from the means by which he was elected, from the charisma that he genuinely has, from the way I think he'd like to exercise power, to a, a political structure that's able to absorb and deal with that, there's going to be a problem.